Nature Revisited, the podcast. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and thank you for joining me on this episode with Yolanda Youngs, featuring our national parks. Yolanda Youngs teaches at the California State University at San Bernardino. Yolanda specializes in environmental and cultural geography, national parks, and protected areas. Yolanda is also an active scholar and leader in the American Association of Geographers and the Association of Pacific Coast Geographers, to name just a few. Yolanda is passionate about communicating geographic and environmental principles to both her students and the general public. National parks do help shape our perception of nature and the environment. Yolanda joins me to talk about how our national parks help shape that relationship both now and into the future. Yolanda, thank you for joining me on Nature Revisited. I have been looking forward to our conversation for quite some time. So let's start with when did you first become interested in our national parks and why? Well, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I love the podcast and your work, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share some of my research and ideas with you and your audience. In terms of my love for national parks, I worked as a outdoor wilderness guide and whitewater raft guide and hiking guide for about a decade. And a lot of the places that I worked were rivers in national parks. And it's through that perspective that I came to really appreciate the many facets of national parks and public lands. And then, of course, through my research and study, I find the idea of public space and how we preserve and protect lands in national parks to be just endlessly fascinating. I teach a class on national parks and public lands. My publications are focused on it. I love it very much, and I spend a lot of time in the field, as well as the archive, as well as the lab, thinking about these ideas. So what do you see as the most crucial issue that faces our national parks today? Boy, that's a great question. For my research, I see four major issues that are really the most pressing concerns for our U.S. national park system. And some of these, I think, connect as well to international systems of parks and protected areas, too. I would say at the top of the list is the impact of climate change on biodiversity. Many of our national parks are at the forefront of climate change. For example, in Glacier National Park, we're seeing dramatically eroding glacial areas. In other national parks, drought we're seeing vegetation that is changing patterns, potentially even spatial locations. And we're also seeing interesting new ways of addressing climate change and biodiversity impacts. The 30 by 30 plan to protect 30% of the Earth's land and water by 2030 is one of the more bigger ideas. And this is international as well as here in the United States. California, the state that I'm in, has its own 30 by 30 plan, and that is one of the ways to potentially increase the number of protected areas. The second issue is access, equity, and diversity in terms of our park visitors, managers, and employees. And by that, I mean ensuring that uh, all people have access to these public lands. The intention of these national park units is that they are public lands accessible to all Americans. But quite frankly, that has not been the history of our system here in the United States. 
in some of my research, I'm really encouraging the thought that we don't need to only encourage diversity of visitors, but we also need to think about our managers of our national park system and our employees and make sure that we have a very diverse workforce in that respect. Access is at the forefront there. Look at, say, a map of national park units in the, across the United States. You'll see that they're spatially imbalanced. There are much larger sections of public lands in the western United States than in the east and in the central United States. There are very large units of public land in Alaska. But one critique of the system is that many of these places are far away from population centers. And so one of the things that I think the National Park Service and other public lands agencies are doing is trying to create new units or expand units that are closer to or perhaps more accessible to our urban populations or at least our population centers. Number three, in terms of issues at the forefront, are indigenous land and water rights, co-stewardship of our public land. So this is a topic that I think your listeners probably have become familiar with through some of your other guests. Certainly we're seeing a really big shift, and I'm seeing it quite a bit in the work that I do with the national park system, Native peoples and Indigenous peoples in the decision-making process and even the development and day-to-day -day use and management of our public land. So that that is shifting. One of the big indicators we've seen is the appointment of Deb Holland as the U.S. Secretary of the Interior. She became the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary. She is a member of the Pueblo Laguna and a 35th generation New Mexican. Recently, at the 2023 White House Tribal Nations Summit, made a series of comments prioritizing co-stewardship with public lands, agencies, and indigenous people. Certainly, indigenous land and water rights and co-stewardship of public lands and national park units is very important. And then finally, the fourth one is one that maybe people don't like to think about as much, but certainly we are all experiencing in some way, if you've been to any national park unit recently, and that fourth one is infrastructure. Part of this is an issue of the national park system is reliant on the federal budget and allocation from Congress, and oftentimes that falls short, so we need to find other monies. But also it relates back to my first issue that I mentioned, which was climate change. So, for example, in June 2022, Yellowstone National Park had really unprecedented heavy, heavy rain. Among the many things that happened, it absolutely destroyed the North Park Road. Road was closed for several months, and the park has been able to create a secondary road discussion about what they're going to do for the future and where they're going to rebuild more permanent road continue. Perhaps your listeners might be thinking about their most recent visit to a national park unit, and they might think about features of infrastructure that need some help. And so that's, that's something we, we certainly need to pay attention to. So how can our national parks help us to understand our changing climate and our place in the environment? Now, our parks can do a lot, and they are doing a lot in that respect. Almost all of our park units, even the ones that might be labeled as a cultural site or a historic site, each one of them represents the environment that they are in. You can visit units in the West and you can experience the Southwest. You can visit units in the central United States and experience the Great Plains. And in the East, of course, you can experience many of our deciduous forests among many different types of biodiversity areas. We can certainly see the effects of climate change in our parks, just simply going to your national park unit and taking a hike. I encourage people to also visit with interpretive rangers and interpretive programs that are working to better explain how climate change is shaping our parks. There's also research programs across our national parks. There's also many collaborations across universities and research study centers 
that are cooperative collaborations between the National Park Service and these other entities that are trying to not only study and better understand climate change, but to bring that data to light for the public. For example, in Glacier National Park, there's been a long-term study there on environmental change as seen through a method called repeat photography. And I'm sure your listeners are familiar with this method, even if they haven't maybe heard about it. But that involves a historic image of a place or photograph, and then the researcher will try to find exactly where that photograph was taken and retake that image. And if you keep repeating that year after year, you get this nice continuum of environmental monitoring through photographic evidence. And in Glacier National Park, they've been doing that for many years, and they have a wonderful record showing the feeding glaciers. And that is certainly one of our more dramatic climate change moments. But again, you could see this across our system in our forests, in our waterways. And I encourage your listeners to go to National Park Service websites for whatever park unit they might be interested in. And almost all of them include a little drop-down menu at the top about nature and culture and research that is going on in the park that is trying to better understand these changes. So this summer, you spent some time doing your research in a number of national parks. Can you share with us what that research entails? I love to study the uh, national park system in a variety of ways, including I'm very dedicated to my field work. I spent part of the summer in the Grand Canyon, have an upcoming book project called Framing Nature. So that was part of my work. I was in the Grand Canyon. I also spent a good part of the summer up in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, where I also do a lot of my work. For that work, I was in Yellowstone, particularly Grand Teton National Park, working on the Upper Snake River, how its geomorphology has changed over time. So that is referring to actually the the course of the river, where it flows, how big its channels are, and it changes from different water flows and other impacts. But I was also really interested in the raft guiding culture there and the river ranger culture there, and really developing a scenic floating river tour of the park that highlights the wildlife, that highlights the cultural resources, and that really profiles the riparian corridor along the Snake River as a distinct area. Those are two of my projects. I also sample across the United States for a variety of other projects that are in the work. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of good stuff going on there in the Teton and also in Grand Canyon. Do you think... Our national parks really serve all Americans. And how important is it that they do? I think one of the pressing issues in the national park system is ensuring access, equity, and diversity of our park visitors and managers and employees. We have the first national park in the world here at Yellowstone National Park, created in 1872. But we didn't have a agency to manage those parks until 1916 with the passage of the Organic Act that created the U.S. National Park Service. And those two foundation acts, they really form the basis of how the United States developed the idea of a national park. And I say the idea because it continues to develop and change. But the intent in writing, at least, was that these were public parks. They are federally managed. They are owned on a national public level. They are in intent, open to all Americans. However, we've seen examples across history where this hasn't been the case. Many of the areas that are referred to as public lands were indigenous lands that Native peoples were forced off of. Treaty rights were either not honored or renegotiated in in ways that did not allow for indigenous use and access of what became national parks. So that needs to be addressed. There are a number of programs in motion right now that I think are shifting the tide on that, but there is a tremendous amount of work that still needs to be done to make sure that indigenous people are 
co-stewards, co-managers of national park units. Historically also, particularly in the eastern United States, Jim Crow laws segregated some park resources, such as in Shenandoah, that did not allow for equal access of all people to all parts of the park. In a more contemporary sense, as I mentioned, park visitors and to some extent park staffing and management is on the road to a more diverse workforce, more efforts are needed. It needs to be a much longer course correction. A lot of good work that needs to be done there. Most people who visit Yellowstone or Yosemite do so to experience a sense of wilderness. How much wilderness is really left in those national parks? You know, when we talk about wilderness, it's useful to understand that there's a actual legal definition of what is wilderness. I'll just start by saying that, you know, in the United States, wilderness is designated and has been defined through the 1964 Wilderness Act. You bring up Yellowstone and Yosemite. Those are are two different cases. Yellowstone has recommended 90% of the park for federal wilderness designation. The park submitted that recommendation in 1972, but to date, Congress has not acted on that recommendation. So that means that formally, Yellowstone does not have designated wilderness areas, and the designated park matters in terms of how they are managed and how the park is provided in terms of the resources that it can manage as wilderness. However, in terms of thinking about how it feels, if you go into Yellowstone, particularly into the south or southeast parts of the park, those are parts of the park that I've spent many of my years in. Most of my research is on Yellowstone Lake and the southeast corners of the park. They're very remote areas. But again, in Yellowstone, the recommendation has been made from the park to Congress, but Congress has not yet acted on that recommendation. So it feels like wilderness, but it's not officially designated and managed as such. Now, for Yosemite, that's a different case. The U.S. Congress designated the Yosemite Wilderness in 1984. It has over 704,000-plus acres of wilderness areas, and that means that they are designated wilderness, they are managed as wilderness. Importantly, they receive part of federal funding to ensure that they are managed as such. Very different places, right? So wilderness Uh, In one sense, it is a uh, formal designation, has a legal definition. In another sense, we can talk about how places just feel wild or how they feel potentially more open or rugged. So I think it's, it's kind of useful to think about those two different ways, hopefully supporting our wilderness movement here in the United States. How important do you think wildness is to all of us? Well... You know, wildness is a state of mind. I can't help but think about how places are are managed. That's part of my research is thinking about how do we actually not just designate these places, but how do we ensure that for the future generations, they feel wild in some way. I spend any time that I can in the backcountry. I particularly happen to enjoy backpacking and hiking and kayak trips and raft trips and things. But I also think it's useful to Keep in mind that wilderness and the idea of wilderness, having that kind of area protected is important, even if we can't access it. Knowing that those areas are there, I think is important for our mental health as Americans. And also, clearly, it's important to have those spaces in terms of protecting and conserving our biodiversity here in the United States. It has been said that we are loving our parks to death. Do you think that is an accurate assessment? And how do you see the National Park Service addressing it? That's a great quote from many years ago. I think that visitation to the park, it ebbs and flows. We saw during COVID, our national park, they swelled with visitors. There were many, many problems and some, some quite frankly, negative impacts of so many visitors visiting our parks. 
keep in mind that the U.S. National Park Service, again, when it was created in, in 1916 with the Organic Act, was charged with what's called a dual mission. That mission sometimes is in conflict. Part of the mission is that they must preserve and protect the natural and cultural resources within those national park units. And the other part of the mission is that they must provide for the public enjoyment and access and visitation. Those two things clash oftentimes. If we are to preserve a trail and ensure that there are very few human impacts and that the vegetation, the wildlife, and the environment is preserved, it is difficult to do that if you have a lot of visitors walking on that trail every day. So some national parks, your listeners may be aware, have started a system of limited entry. Zion National Park has done this, Glacier National Park. And the idea here is that you have to sign up ahead of time, uh, oftentimes online, to enter the parks. And this is limiting the number of people in the park each day, decreasing the impact we might have just simply by the number of humans. You know, those kind of things sometimes people find challenging. But again, we love our national parks. The idea that the parks are loved to death, that actually is a a phrase that gets repeated often. It comes from the U.S. National Park Service Director Conrad Wirth. He was director from 1951 to 64, one of the longest serving directors. And that was in response to the huge swing upward of visitation to the national parks after World War II. After the war, Americans came home and really wanted to enjoy vacations and enjoy their parks. And so Conrad Worth was making this statement as a call to Congress and as a call to American people to reinvest in our national parks. Again, it's, it's a tough task that the National Park Service is managing, providing for the protection and preservation of our natural cultural resources, while at the same time balancing access and use and visitation. What are some of the changes that you see the National Park Service might need to make as they move into the future? That's a big question. I think the National Park Service is one of many federal agencies that's tasked with this dual mission to both preserve and protect natural and cultural resources and at the same time provide for visitation. They often do this on a limited budget, and they often do this with a workforce which is seasonal or at least moves around quite a bit. From my research, I think. They need to consider more directly working with Native Americans, ensuring that Indigenous people have not only equal access and use of uh, national park units, but also are brought to the table and ensure that Indigenous people are part of the management and also making sure that Indigenous people are part of the employment, part of the uh, managers. So I think the Park Service needs to continue to move in that direction, and we're, we're seeing some of that. I'm working on an article right now that highlights some of the work that's being done in Grand Canyon National Park and Yellowstone National Park, just to name a few, where they're working with affiliated tribes and trying to create not only cultural demonstration areas, but also actually redeveloping parts of the park with a, a co-stewardship idea where the affiliated tribe get a direct say in what kind of development is taking place there. I think climate change, of course, is one of the bigger challenges we're we're facing here. And the Park Service continues to work on programs to not only address climate change impact, but very importantly, we, we continue to need to track and document climate change in the future. I also want to say that in terms of public lands agencies, the National Park Service is in charge of preservation. And I know some of your uh, other speakers on this podcast and perhaps your audience are familiar with these very distinct ideas in the United States between conservation and preservation. 
for preservation, that's primarily the task of the National Park Service. And the idea being that these areas need to be preserved just as they are when they are designated as national parks, as opposed to conservation, where resources are being wisely used and consumed, but managed so that those resources are available for future generations. So we might think of the U.S. Forest Service as a conservation agency. Again, national parks are for preservation. So trying to preserve important cultural sites, historical sites, and natural heritage. I think the the Park Service is moving towards perhaps rethinking some of its workforce program to ensure that there is not only Indigenous voices, but voices that represent uh, the, the tremendous diversity in the United States. And I think they're moving in that direction, but it's, it's a large agency, and I think we're going to see these changes unfold in the coming years. Does the National Park Service, do they look at restoration as part of their mission? The Park Service is, like all the public lands agencies, I think to a certain extent, is engaging in restoration ideas in the scholarly realm and in terms of a lot of the applied research fields out there, ecology, biology, geology, called by different things. Restoration might be nature-based solutions. That's what I'm seeing quite a bit of in national park actual policies. But in terms of restoration, tricky topic with scholars because you have to pick the point that you're going to restore to. In one sense, the Park Service could be considered, I guess, a a restoration agency. They certainly are much more of a preservation agency. And the point being here that they're not often rebuilding or restoring natural and cultural sites. For the Park Service, the mission is preservation. The overarching goal here is to preserve the landscapes as they are. When we think of, for example, the goal of that 30 by 30 plan that I mentioned early on, protecting 30% of the Earth's land and waters by 2030, protecting is not just Park Service, not just Forest Service, not just Bureau of Land Management. It's creating some sort of protection so that we have a use plan for how much that area is going to be developed, if at all, what kind of uses are going to be there and mostly making decisions that favor the most advantageous conditions for biodiversity and resilient landscapes for climate change. Restoration is very alluring, but it's applied differently to federal lands, city lands, state lands. Our public lands, going a little bit bigger than the Park Service or Forest Service or or any of these agencies, but just thinking of public lands, areas that we protect for public spaces, they are unevenly distributed. The the geographic distribution is uneven across the United States. What your listeners in the East and how they maybe conceive of nature and culture and restoration could be quite different from your listeners in the Western United States. I'm situated here in California. We have large swaths of public land. Ideas of restoration are basically settling into the landscape and shaping out very differently from East versus West, because you maybe have in the East more private land. So folks in the East are going to be more reliant on a system that is public-private collaborations. We have a lot of public lands out here. So how we approach restoration will be shaped very much by what public lands agencies It's all important, but how it takes place in the state that you and your listeners are in is going to vary with with our geographic context. And sometimes I think it's easy to kind of group all this into one thing. I would like to go back just a bit. How important is the relationship between indigenous people and national parks? The United States had the first national park with Yellowstone. For better or for worse, that idea was culturally exported around the world, and very actively so. You know, as a geographer, I'll point out that, of course, when you 
deposit a new idea in a new culture, in a new environment, it's going to take shape differently based on the local culture and environment. So some national park systems around the world dispossessed indigenous people, forced people off of their land in a variety of horrific sometimes and sad ways. Some countries are addressing those past issues very directly. The U.S. National Park System started in the United States with Yellowstone in 1872. The UNESCO World Heritage Site System is in direct conversation with that and was established in 1972, particularly took a different approach to the people living in the lands or uh, using the waters that were being created as some sort of a public park. And there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done to not only recognize the history, if we come back to the United States, to recognize the history of land and water dispossession, the forced removal, and many, many tribes are now working to try to regain their land and water rights as well as, very importantly, their traditional access and use to their traditional homeland. There are lots of different approaches to how are we going to, A, recognize this past and tragic history, which it needs to be recognized clearly, and two, how are we going to address it right now, and three, how are we going to build structures to move forward in a very different way than perhaps you know, 100 plus years of public land stewardship has looked like in the United States. Those are, those are big, big questions and problems. Just at the beginning of this year, in January 2024, there was the first indigenous sovereign habitat tribal conservation district, Mountains to the Sea, that was created in Alaska. That is a intertribal commission working towards co-management agreements with the Bureau of Land Management and several other federal land agencies to try to co-manage land and waters. But the idea that multiple tribes are coming together and that they are collaborating and in partnership with federal agencies, that type of model is one of the ones that I'm seeing move forward. There are other models that suggest that public lands like national parks or national forests should be moved back towards one tribe or group of tribes managing them as opposed to the federal government per se. Those efforts are certainly in debate across the United States. My last question, what role do you see our national parks playing as we maneuver into the future? The future and value and what they hold is An experimental space in one respect. I think, again, the idea of national parks is one that continues to evolve and change as we move along. I think as a scholar, that's fascinating. But also, I think it can be inspiring and engaging for not just scholars, but for anybody to think about what do we do with spaces that we call public and spaces that we are designating as important for their natural and cultural resources. Just the concept of that, I think, is is useful intellectually as well as what we might be doing as a society and culture. And I think our national park units will continue to serve as important places, restorative activities in terms of thinking our overall health and wellness. I think they will also, in a third way, will serve as experimental areas where we have the opportunity to try out new ideas. And I think our national parks offer an opportunity for us to think about how we will live amidst climate change and how we will adapt to it, and how we will become resilient. Also, the national parks provide a place for us to work together in a not just natural laboratory where we get to see ecological processes at work, but also a cultural and social laboratory where we get to try these new approaches towards environmental management. Continuing these conversations is important. And I think having the concept of a national park is important for our country in a variety of ways. I hope you enjoyed 
my conversation with Yolanda Youngs and that you get the chance to visit her website, YolandaYoungs.com, to learn more about all the exciting things she is doing. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends, family, and colleagues. If you would like to share your thoughts or comments on this or any other episode, please email me at NordenPro at gmail.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N-P-R-O at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. You can follow Nature Revisited on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and our website, NordenProductions.com. The music for Nature Revisited is Tim Buckley, Buzz and Fly. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. And I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature.